Welcome back. You're listening to Across the Border, a Prophecy Reality Edition today. And we're going to dive into a little history, which is prophecy fulfilled because it was given in advance. And that's what prophecy is. It's history given in advance. And so much of uh, the prophecy that was given in uh, the Bible to God's people was subsequently filled. And uh, then you can read the fulfillment in books that were later added to God's word uh, after the fulfillment took place, which is a very interesting thing. It teaches us about prophecy given, prophecy fulfilled, and gives us a great clue as to how to interpret prophecy, and especially those parts that, well, we're not going to get any more written uh, fulfillment of prophecy af after the last book of the Bible was written, which was a book of prophecy about 95 AD, yeah, toward the end of the first century there, John wrote the Revelation. So all of that, we have to rely on our instruction from God's word in prophecy given, prophecy fulfilled, and interpretation given in order to understand how to handle that prophecy that has subsequently been fulfilled but we have to decipher it for ourselves because we don't have any more books uh, that have been written or are going to be written to add to the Bible for uh, a divine interpretation. So we take the divine interpretation that we have of what has already been given and then subsequently fulfilled, and we use that. That's what few, uh, historicism is all about. Yeah, as opposed to futurism, which is all speculation. Yeah. Anyway, so the futurists speculate that what I'm reading about, the destruction of Jerusalem, which was a fulfillment of the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the end of it, a 40-year period, um, they want to put that into their seven-year tribulation fantasy or deception, as I call it, in the future. But we're reading about the actual fulfillment because this prophecy was not to the church. It was to Israel and 70 weeks were determined. So we should see this culminate in the 70 weeks or, and shortly thereafter, because that's what the 70 weeks prophecy says that there would things that would happen in the 70 weeks and things that would happen immediately after the 70 weeks and Anything that's after can be any time after, even up to 40 years after, because that's all it gives us is says after. Okay, and that probably makes no sense to a lot of people who haven't been keeping up with me and to understand exactly what the controversy about Daniel 70 weeks is. And I have some articles on my website, you, so you can prove that or get my recent book, um, when the third temple is built, the rapture play will begin. It explains it all in detail for you. And you can get that free. Go to the free ebook tab on my website there at crosstheborder.org and we'll take care of you. Okay, now we're going to jump into it and pick up where we left off uh, last time. We're talking about the Jesus predictions at Jerusalem. And here is a paragraph. The next prediction of our Lord related to the persecution of his disciples. They shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And they shall deliver you up to councils and in the synagogues. Ye shall be beaten and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. Now, any, any prophecy that Jesus gave of things that would happen immediately following his death uh, were recorded in the scripture for us. And all of the prophecies he gave about the destruction, the annihilation of the na nation, and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, those are all recorded in the scripture for us. And also, they coincide with the same prophecy, the, the same prophecies that Daniel gave of the same destruction and the same annihilation and the 70 weeks that were determined and the things that would follow 
the 70 weeks in the annihilation of the nation. In the very infancy of the Christian church, these unmerited and unprovoked cruelties began to be inflicted. Our Lord and his forerunner, John the Baptist, had already been put to death. The apostles Peter and John were first imprisoned, and then, together with the other apostles, were scourged before the Jewish council. Stephen, after confounding the Sanhedrin with his irresistible eloquence, was stoned to death. Herod Agrippa stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, beheaded James, the brother of John, and again imprisoned Peter, designing to put him to death also. St. Paul pleaded before the Jewish council at Jerusalem and before Felix, the Roman governor, who trembled on the judgment seat while the intrepid prisoner reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Two years later, he was brought before the tribunal of Festus, who had succeeded Felix in the government. King Agrippa the Younger being present, who, while the governor scoffed, ingeniously acknowledged the force of the apostle's eloquence and, half convinced, exclaimed, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Lastly, he pleaded before the emperor Nero at Rome. He was also brought with Silas before the rulers at Philippi, where both of them were scourged and imprisoned. Paul was likewise imprisoned two years in Judea, and afterwards twice at Rome each time for the space of two years. He was scourged by the Jews five times, thrice beaten with rods, once stoned. Nay, he himself, before his conversion, was an instrument of fulfilling these predictions. St. Luke relates of him that he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and committed them to prison. When they were put to death, he gave his voice against them. He punished them oft in every synagogue and persecuted them even into strange cities. And to this agree his own declarations. At length, about two years before the Jewish war, the first general persecution commenced at the instigation of the emperor Nero, who says Tacitus inflicted upon the Christians punishments exquisitely painful multitudes suffered a cruel martyrdom amidst derision and insults, and among the rest the venerable apostles St. Peter and St. Paul. Our Lord continues, And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The hatred from which the above recited persecution sprang was not provoked on the part of the Christians. By a contumacious resistance to established authority or by any violations of the law, but was the unavoidable consequence of their sustaining the name and imitating the example of their master. It was a war, says Tertullian, against the very name. To be a Christian was of itself crime enough. And to the same effect is that expression of Pliny in his letter to Trajan. I asked them whether they were Christians. If they confessed it, I asked them a second time and a third time, threatening them with punishment. And those who persevered, I commanded to be led away to death. It is added, of all nations. Whatever animosity or dissensions might subsist between the Gentiles and Jews on other points, they were at all times ready to unite and to cooperate in the persecution of the humble followers of him who came to be a light to the former and a glory to the latter. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. Concerning this fact, the following decisive testimony of Tacitus may suffice. Speaking of the persecutions of the Christians under Nero, 
to which we have just alluded, he, he adds, several were seized who confessed, and by their discovery a great multitude of others were convicted and barbarously executed. And the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Of the fulfillment of this prediction, the epistles of St. Paul, addressed to the Christians at Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, and those of Peter to the brethren in Pontus, Cappadocia, and Bithynia, are monuments now standing, for neither of these apostles were living when the Jewish war commenced. St. Paul, too, in his epistle to the Romans, informs them that their faith was spoken of throughout all the world. And in that, too, the Colossians, he observes, that the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven. Clement, who was a fellow laborer with the apostle, relates of him that he taught the whole world righteousness, traveling from the east westward to the borders of the ocean. Eusebius says that the apostles preached the gospel in all the world, and that some of them passed beyond the bounds of the ocean and visited the Britannic Isles. So also says Theodoret. It appears, says Bishop Newton, from the historians of the church, that before the destruction of Jerusalem, the gospel was not only preached in the Lesser Asia and Greece and Italy, the great theaters of action then in the world, but was likewise propagated as far northward as Scythia, as far southward as Ethiopia, as far eastward as Parthia and India, as far westward as Spain and Britain. And Tacitus asserts that the Christian religion, which arose in Judea, spread over many parts of the world and extended to Rome itself, where the professors of it, as early as the time of Nero, amounted to a vast multitude, insomuch that their numbers excited the jealousy of the government. Thus completely was fulfilled a prediction contrary to every conclusion that could have been grounded on moral probability and to the accomplishment of which every kind of impediment was incessantly opposed. The reputed son of a carpenter instructs a few simple fishermen in a new religion, destitute of worldly incentives, but full of self-denials, sacrifices, and suffering, and tells them, that in about 40 years it should spread over all the world. It spreads accordingly, and in defiance of the exasperated bigotry of the Jews, and of all of the authority, power, and active opposition of the Gentile nations, it is established within that period in all the countries to which it penetrates. Can anyone doubt but that the prediction and its fulfillment were equally divine? Such, briefly, is the account that history gives of the several events and signs which our Lord had foretold would precede the destruction of the holy city. No sooner were his predictions accomplished than a most unaccountable infatuation seized upon the whole Jewish nation, so that they not only provoked, but seemed even to rush into the midst of those unparalleled calamities, which at length totally overwhelmed them. In an essay of this sort, it is impossible to enter into a minute detail of the origin and progress of these evils. But such particulars as illustrate the fulfillment of the remaining part of the prophecy and justify the strong language in which it is couched shall be presented to the reader. And at this point, we're going to jump in the insurrection and the Roman war. This is all history, my friends. A history that most people do not know, and especially the futurists. And many out there who are still trying to, they think, 
I've heard people, and I've even said it myself in the past because I heard it so much, that Jesus will come once that last soul is saved, once everyone on earth, once the gospel is spread to the entire world. Well, the, the gospel was spread to the entire world before Jerusalem and the Jewish nation were destroyed in 70 AD. And we just read a part of it, but it is all history. So it is very important to learn history and not allow these futurists to speculate on things that have already been fulfilled, taking them away from their fulfillment and putting them off into a fictional space of time in the future. In Jesus' time, when Jesus was walking on the earth and he was giving prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the annihilation of the nation, you can see why he became so unpopular, especially with the governing authorities and the religious elite of his day, the scribes, the Pharisees, and all of the religious leaders who had their position by the government. Kind of like the same thing that's going on in America and around the world today. I mean, the Antichrist loves religion to be under government because, believe it or not, the Antichrist does rule the world. But here's the point, is they were teaching the people a false narrative that not Jesus, this Messiah who was killed, because of course their Messiah would never suffer death. He would never be killed. And of course, just because those, as they would put it, those uh, disciples of his lied <laughs> and, and died for a man who never rose from the dead, <laughs> To propagate the lie. I mean, how many people will die to propagate a lie? But anyway, that's the story they were given. And that the true, when the true Messiah would come, he would overthrow the Roman powers. And he would raise up Israel, the Hebrew nation, to rule the entire earth. Well, so what they were taking is they were taking yet future prophecy. They were taking prophecy of the millennial reign of Christ, of the Sabbath millennium. And they're saying, we're going to get that immediately. And they were casting it in a light. But it was it, while they were using the Bible, they neglected the parts that they didn't want to hear about the suffering Messiah. And they jumped right to the part they wanted to hear to a ruling Messiah. So Jesus could not have been it. So they pushed the narrative that the true Messiah, not that Jesus guy, okay, that the, the true Israel Messiah would come and he would conquer the Roman Empire. So you can see why they would jump headlong into their own destruction and bring it upon themselves because they were following a false narrative. And, you know, I write a book about today's false narrative. And that book is, uh, of course, When the Third Temple is Built. This is a narrative that is false. When the Third Temple is built, the rapture play will begin because the raptures are the false narratives. And it's, it's really ingenious. The narrative is ingenious, the, the Antichrist narrative that most of what were Protestants, now evangelicals, uh, believe in the modern church today is a false narrative, just as the Jewish people believed in that day during the actual time of Jacob's trouble. They did not recognize that they were in the time of Jacob's trouble unless they listened and they believed the true Messiah that is Yahshua, Jesus, the Messiah, and he, they believed the prophecies that he gave them. And their prophecies, they, they could have believed. All they had to do was look in the scripture and go, no, this guy's prophecies match up with Daniel, 70 weeks prophecy. 70 weeks are determined. The 70 weeks, they were in the 70th week when Jesus was speaking to them. They were in the first half of the 70th week when Jesus was ministering and preaching to them and, com 
and confirming the prophecies of the 70 weeks of Daniel. And he, in the midst of the week, put an end to the sacrifice and oblation by the sacrifice of himself. Then he rose from the dead. And that was our evidence. That was the evidence of those men who died for this officially false Messiah, while the rest of the nation and those who followed the religious elite of the day, those that were backed by the Roman government, see, things kind of never change, do they? Same picture. <laughs> Different day, you know? Well, they say history doesn't repeat, but it certainly does rhyme, doesn't it? I like that saying, because it's rhyming today. History is rhyming, and the world is running headlong. I mean, just, we talked about the, uh, the greatest show, the, the, the script that's being followed here in, in the political heaven of the world. And you go, wow, this cannot be true. I, I would think that I was knowingly watching a fiction. <laughs> and so the world is running headlong following the croaking frogs and listening to the dragon speak of the one horn of the earth beast. Now, I listen to the quiet, to the, to the lamb-like. You know, it's like God said, the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. Okay, in our next segment, we're going to jump into that next chapter, the beginning of the Roman War. It's, it's amazing and frightening and astounding. You'll see. We'll be back in a few minutes. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. 